Broadcasting from the Investor Hour studios and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes, Google Play, and everywhere you find podcasts for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here's your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Today, we'll talk with Simon Hallett, a former portfolio manager with Harding Lubner. In the mailbag today, a big, big question about inflation and some questions about crypto and El Salvador. And remember, the mailbag is a conversation, so talk to me on our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357, and hear your voice on the show. In my opening rant this week, I'll talk about, well, not looking at the news for a week and counting, and then I'll tell you a little bit about this year's Value X Vale conference. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. So two things real quick before we talk to Simon Hallett, who sounds like a really interesting guy, I have to say. Can't wait to do this. But first of all, I've been on a news diet for a week. No news, no Twitter. And I also did not allow myself to shop for the things that I sort of obsessively shop for, like guns, ammo, um, gun parts, you know, new gun. You always want to upgrade your gun. And for some reason, you know, guitars, of course, because I play the guitar. And, and for some reason, cars. I have the same, I've been driving the same car for almost 20 years, but anyway, maybe that's why I'm shopping obsessively for them. So none of that. I've done none of that right up until the time you're hearing my voice. And I'm going to try to keep it up for as long as I can. And I got this idea from a fellow named Rolf Debelli, a Swiss fellow uh, who himself has not looked at the news since 2010. Now, it doesn't mean he doesn't know what's going on in the world. He goes to original sources. He goes to original sources when he hears that there's a pandemic or some other big development in the world. So he'll, instead of watching the news, he'll go right to the CDC website or something like that. That's that's what it really means. So I've been, you know, not looking at any of my news sources. I, I subscribe to all kinds of news sources and I didn't look at any of them, haven't looked at any of them right up until this moment. And I have to say, it puts me in a different frame of mind and it really immediately, immediately within 24 to 48 hours, I thought, boy, I've been wasting so much time looking at news. The thing about looking at news, especially online where you're bombarded with all kinds of stuff, you know, it's different from looking at a printed page to me anyway, you instantly are aware of how often your attention, or in my case, I'll just blame myself, I won't blame all humanity, how often my attention is pulled away like every several seconds or a minute or so. And just not doing that for you know a whole week or a little more at this point has been amazing. You know, you're, you're more likely to sit down and just read a book or, you know, if you want to find out about some particular stock, you don't go to the news, you go to the SEC website and just read the 10K. Or if you want to find out about an industry, you go to, you know, maybe the industry group website or something like that. And it it actually prompts me to, to read more of those long form original sources rather than the shorter form news stories. And I think it just gets you a better quality of information. I think most news is pretty poor quality information. Rolf Debelli, who started all this stuff, the guy who created this, this news diet idea, and as far as I know, he talks about, he, sa he says it right. He says, news is the absolute worst quality information. You're more likely to be radically misinformed than informed. So that, I think that's all I'll say about that. I highly recommend that you do this. Learn to, to ignore the news and go to original sources for things you want to learn about. And also avoiding Twitter has been very good. That's the one that's just insidious for me because one thing leads to another and another and another and pretty soon an hour has gone by. 
The next thing I want to talk about is ValueX Veil. This is an annual invitation-only investment conference, mostly attended by fund managers, but there's also people who are not fund managers, a few of them. One guy was a Google executive who runs his own portfolio. And then, and I'm a newsletter writer, mostly. I, I don't manage other people's money at all, certainly. So I can't tell you the stock picks, although somebody recommended Qualcomm. I mean, I can tell you that one. But, but the others, they don't want their research getting out there for some reason, and I'll just respect that. But there are a couple of things like this one fellow, um, you can follow him on Twitter. His name's Rishi Gosalia. And Rishi Gosalia actually came up with what I'm going to throw my quote of the week in here with this. And the quote of the week is, hold a high bar and wait patiently. And I think he'll even credit somebody else. I think a friend of his said that to him. But I'll credit you, Rishi, if you're out there. And I thought that was really great because it addresses two really important aspects of investing, which are, you know, hold a high bar, which is really just knowing what you're doing. Hold a high bar, meaning have a system, have a viewpoint, look, you know, if you're looking for high quality growth companies or something, then stick to that. You know, don't get your attention pulled away by somebody at a cocktail party and then run off and buy something without any you know, research or information or without it being a part of your investment strategy that you have decided is right for you. So hold a high bar, know what you're looking for and wait patiently, wait patiently in both aspects, wait for your setups, for your trade setups or the right kind of companies that at the right price, whatever it is you're looking for. And then once you get it, wait patiently, you know, for the idea to to go up or down or whatever it's going to do, right? But with equities, the more patient you are, if it's a really good high quality business that's compounding at high rates and reinvesting capital at very high rates, patience is going to make you rich, bottom line. So that was one of the big things that came out of the event that, you know, he was the one, Rishi is the one who said that and spelled it out in his presentation. But so many other people in the event say things like that. Like everybody is long-term oriented there. Nobody's like, you know, an options. There are no options traders there. You know, these are long-term equity investors who think of the stocks they buy as a piece of a real company. So they have ownership in a real business and they want to know about it as if they own the whole thing. And another thing I wanted to point out was... Um, a quote by a guy, the quote is actually by Jerry Seinfeld, but it was put up on, on in his presentation by a guy named Matt Griffith, really gr great guy um, who has attended the event, I think, as long as I have. So Matt, before he got onto his stock pick, he he talked about Jerry Seinfeld, who said, survival is the new success. Survival is the new success. And Seinfeld was talking about the stand-up comedy profession. And Seinfeld says, basically, look, if you've been around the business for, um, you know, decades, basically, and you're still getting paid and still getting gigs, you've survived and you win. That's success. Because apparently it is just the most insanely competitive thing in the world. You know, audiences are ruthless. They laugh at what they laugh at and they don't laugh at what they don't laugh at. And, you know, these the, you generally play to small venues, the audience is right there, people are heckling you, it's tough. And it's tough to stick around even if you have a good year or two. And, and Seinfeld talked about that and Matt talked about it too. And the, the parallels with investing are interesting because, for example, at one point, Matt was saying that you know, somebody asked Seinfeld about uh, getting feedback from your peers. And Seinfeld was like, who needs feedback from your peers? You step off the stage. You just got all the feedback you need. And it's the exact same way with investing. You don't need feedback from your peers. You try your ideas in the market and you'll find out pretty quick or, you know, within a reasonable amount of time, right? You got to be patient. But you'll find out. The market will tell you. You won't need feedback from your peers. And your feedback from your peers doesn't really matter what happens in the market after you put your ideas to work with real money, that's what matters, right? So you either, as a stand-up com comic, you either get laughs or you don't. And as an investor, you either make money or you don't. And 
I, I found that interesting because a lot of people approach investing like they think this is going to be easy, but I doubt if very many of those people would say, yeah, I can be a stand-up comic, you know, <laughs> because that's brutal. Just getting in front of an audience scares the daylights out of many people. And, you know, getting in front of the audience and having to tell your own original comedy material, which is either going to, you know, probably going to bomb, right, as a lot of it does for those, you know, comedians we never hear from again. You know, that would be a different story. And we talk about, you've hear, heard people say things like, you know, you wouldn't do your own brain surgery. Why do you think you can, you know, manage your own money as well as Warren Buffett or something like that? And I don't think that's really right. I think people can manage their own money. However, they should recognize that it is a highly competitive playing field and you do need an edge. And the lowest hanging fruit, I've said this many, many, many times, the easiest edge to get is simply to be patient and have a long-term horizon because almost nobody does. The market just trades millions and millions of shares a day, turns over, and, and people just get nervous. You know, they're down a few percent and they sell out and, and then, you know, they don't get the benefit of the long-term compounding. And overall, I have to say, going to Value X Vale, like I've been there a bunch of times and I've presented three times. And contributing is wonderful. And, and just being around a group of kind of more or less like minded people and interchanging ideas is good. So, you know, if you can do that in your business and in your life, I highly recommend that you do so. It's tough in the age of COVID, but, you know, do your best. <laughs> All right, that's all for for that right now. And remember, my quote of the week was from Rishi Gosalia. You can f uh, follow him on Twitter. His name is R I S H I Gosalia G O S A L I A. You can find him on Twitter. I bet he's a really good follow. I just started following him because I just met him uh, this past week. Uh, Hold a high bar and wait patiently. Great advice for investors, for especially for equity investors. All right, let's do it. Let's talk with Simon Hallett. Let's do it right now. So I need to talk to everyone seriously here for just a minute, because right now we're in this weird emotional market with a lot of fear and greed controlling what the average investor is doing with their money. That's why we're seeing a lot of money pouring into crazy investments like NFTs and meme stocks and penny cryptos. People see the market still near record highs and they're scared of getting left behind. They want to be part of all the hot money making stories we're hearing right now. But really, for most people, unfortunately, it's a bunch of crap. You're probably going to lose everything chasing speculative gains like that. Just ask someone who bought AMC stock or a bunch of Dogecoin a few months ago. It's the exact opposite of how I approach investing. That's why I'd like for you to check out a new video I just posted online at ExtremeValueStock.com. In the video, I'm sharing details of a fantastic risk-averse value stock opportunity that my research is showing could return about 200% over the next 24 months. I'd love for you to check it all out by heading over to extremevaluestock.com. But please hurry, because the stock I'll be telling you about is getting close to exceeding my buy-up-to-price recommendation. And once it does, I'll probably have to take the video offline. So one more time to learn the details, head over to ExtremeValueStock.com today. That's ExtremeValueStock.com. All right, time for our interview once again. Today's guest is Simon Hallett, a former portfolio manager with Harding Lubner and owner of a British soccer team, which is really cool. And we're going to talk about that. Welcome to the program. It's great of you to be here. Thanks very much, Dan. It's an honor to be invited. So naturally, the topic at Stansberry Investor Hour is investing. So the first thing we need to talk about is soccer. <laughs> we need to talk about uh, the Plymouth Argyle, which you, you own substantially all of that, do you not? I do. Um, yeah, I became a shareholder in Plymouth Argyle about uh, five years ago. And then about uh, three years ago, I became the majority owner and, and chairman. So I've gradually become more involved, yeah. Yeah, and uh, we, for our listeners' sake, since you know they're mostly in the United States, Plymouth Argyle is a 
a British football club known to us as a British soccer team. And uh, how, how are they doing? Um, we're currently lying eighth after six games of this season in the third tier of English football, which perhaps surprisingly is known as League One. League One, <laughs> there, there, all right. There, there, are, there are four uh, divisions of entirely professional football in the UK. The first, first of which will be familiar to people is the English Premier League. The second is called the Championship. The third is League One and the fourth is League Two. And that's the apex of a pyramid, pyramid of soccer that extends down to you know your local bar team. Right. So I was looking through, um, there was a Q&A that I was reading about this where you would answer some questions, you know, coming in as a majority owner and so forth. The thing that really intrigued me was the the limit on on player salaries, uh, which looked like fifty five percent of revenues at the time of the question. Uh, at the time of the question, it was fifty five. In the current uh, division we're in, it's sixty percent of revenues. Yeah. Right. So, but, but uh, the first thing on my mind was, does everybody have the same size budget? No. No. We, <laughs> so... we have, no. There, there are there are several problems with this uh, form of salary cap. One is that revenue is uh, defined in a way that will appall any listeners to an investor related podcast such as this one, in that revenue includes equity injections. So <laughs> if I decide to, if I decide- That's to, weird. It's very, very weird. It's uh, been very controversial, but at root, it's actually quite a good system because it means that the bigger clubs can spend a higher dollar amount, but the same fixed proportion of their overall revenues. And that that's pretty good. That would actually have properly applied and without the counting of equity injections as revenue, uh, be pretty good for Plymouth Argo. All right, Simon, you've come to the right man. I'm going to put your team at the top of the leaderboard in one fell swoop. You need to meet Jeff Bezos. You need to be good friends with him and, and get an equity injection and crank the revenue up. He could, he could triple your revenues. <laughs> he, could, he could indeed. My, well, actually, he could more than triple our revenues. Of course, yes. Um, I think one, one of the things that confuses people quite often, um, you know, coming from the investment world or the company research world in particular, about football is that football, or soccer, sorry, is uh, very salient. It gets a lot of publicity. It looms large in people's minds. And yet it's actually a fairly small business. If, uh, if the biggest clubs in the world were listed on you know, what one of the world's leading stock markets, they, 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 made, they would make it only to a small cap index. So the football industry is actually fairly small, but it has astonishingly large reach, you know, with billions of people. Like you know, the biggest Premier League players. teams, you mean, if they were yeah, listed? They, they, if they were listed, they'd be in the small cap index. I, you know, the market capitalization of Manchester United, which is owned by the same, uh, the Glazers who own uh, Tampa Bay Bucks. Uh, Manchester United is listed. I think it's still listed. It doesn't actually trade much, but it's market capitalization. I'm going to guess is somewhere between three and four billion dollars. So they're small caps. It, it's it's a it's a industry that looms large in the imagination of the public, but actually is not as economically influential as people think. So what's what's the lesson? There's got to be a lesson. You know, Buffett Warren Buffett tells us being a good businessman makes me a better investor. Being a better investor makes me a better businessman. What's the intersection here for you between investing and football club ownership? Um, for, for, first of all, I, I'm from the town of Plymouth and uh, I was a you know fan as a schoolboy standing on the terraces at Argyle, uh, watching them going back to 1966. So this is very much, uh, it, it's, it's an investment only in a very loose sense in that I paid money to buy shares. <laughs> it's not an investment upon which I expect much of a return. Um, it's partly um, a kind of boyhood dream and it's partly something of a payback to the people of Plymouth who, you know, You're the old softy. Fares, I am a bit of a softy. Yeah. It's not <laughs> you know, payback. You know, it, normally one of my favorite rants is I hate it when people say, Oh, Bill Gates is giving back. You know, it's like, well, what, well, what did he ever take from us that he has, has to give it back? You know, what, what he did was change, change the world for a hundred bucks. Um, and, you know, modern capitalism, I think, differs from uh, wealth creation in the, in the old days. In the olden days, if you wanted to get rich, you had to knock somebody on the head and steal their stuff. Um, today, if you want to get rich, you have to provide goods and services at prices that people want to pay. 
and I don't normally like the concept of giving back, but in this case, um, the people at the ratepayers of Plymouth paid for my education from the age of 10 through 21. It was a very good education. And, um, you know, I feel that I do owe them something back as I've been able, been able to you know, generate rents on that education throughout my career. So it's a bit of payback and a bit of fun, frankly. But I share the pet peeve, by the way, about that phrase. Always, it, it annoys me. Yeah, and I, look, I think it's wonderful. Let me just be clear. I think it's wonderful that people who acquire wealth are philanthropic. Um, you know, I like to think I am myself. But the idea that they're returning something that they stole or temporarily borrowed is outrageous in my view. They're net creators. I mean, exactly. it's, it's silly. Yeah, by, yeah. by definition, by definition. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you, can, you can buy windows for 100 bucks. I know. Like, <laughs> I, I, I mean, there, there are huge surpluses, and I suspect that we, we, we actually owe some of them to him. But the intersection, I, I, I've been absolutely fascinated by this intersection of investing and managing a football team. Um, but it's not about ownership of the club, it's really about decision making. So the, the, what, what's common to investing and to soccer is that um, short term outcomes are the result of both luck and skill. And yet people attribute uh, successful outcomes always to skill and unsuccessful outcomes to bad luck. It's, it's, it's an absolute constant. So all the behavioral biases that we see in investing that you know, can damage your, your portfolio returns, we see um, very, very large in the world of soccer. And it's, I was just saying to somebody earlier that we had a very good win on the weekend against a um, a much wealthier team than us and the narrative is all about um, it, it, the, the narrative about the match is driven by the outcome it's not driven by what actually happened on the pitch and you see that time and time again and that, it can lead to very very bad decision making in the same way that you know if you buy a stock because you think it's deeply undervalued you have expected returns of you know eight or nine percent versus expected returns for the market of six and um, you know you expect those kind of returns to compound as price and value converge. You know, to classic. Um, you know, pr price is what you pay, and value is what you get. Um, ge generating investment returns, but then the stock compl completely out of the blue gets taken over. You, you think, well, I was very clever buying it, but of course you you got lucky. Um, so it's very very important that you learn uh, to be, to distinguish when you've been lucky and when you've been skillful. So those biases, it's not easy at all. Um, and the other thing that is so common in both businesses is that we revere those who are successful, even if it's only uh, over short periods of time. And you know, we, we, we never think that they've been merely lucky. And in football, it's actually that there's uh, a lot of evidence that the market for footballers is fairly efficient so you know if we think that market efficiency is that you know you, you're essentially going to get a market return adjusted for risk from a basket a diversified basket of stocks it's the same it's pretty much the same in football if you pay the market price for your team you will get market you, you, you'll get what you pay for essentially it's a fairly efficient market so the job when you're assembling a portfolio of stocks is to buy a portfolio of assets that will make for a diversified portfolio, but where you think there is a disconnect between the price you're paying and the value that you're receiving. Um, and it's, it's hard. It's hard to identify those stocks. Similarly in football, it's hard to identify those players. Um, there's a kind of burgeoning industry of data analytics that enables us as football club executives to think about the portfolio assets, but commonly uh, data analysis is ignored and people prefer to go with their gut, just as they did in investing when, when I started, you know, 40, 45 years ago. And as they did in American baseball before the, what, what I might call the money ball era, you know, the Bill James era. Yeah, before, before absolutely, before the Bill James, Billy Bean era. So, and again, th so this is another, yet another interesting, interesting intersection, intersection of uh, football 
and investing, so soccer and investing. Um, it's that it, we all know about these behavioral biases that we have. Uh, we all know about how to use data to identify underpriced baseball players, but very few people did it. Um, so it's not what you know that gives you the competitive edge. It's being able to take what you know, which is often what everybody else knows, and being able to apply it in your organization. And I think that that was the great key to the success of the Oakland Athletics under Billy Bean in the early days. Everybody knew, knew what Bill James was saying, but Billy had uh, Art Howe, the coach, report to him. And if Art Howe said he wanted to steal bases or bunt, Billy Bean would say, no, you're not going to. And Art Howe, Howe had two choices. He could either not steal, not bunt, or he could walk himself. Sorry, that's a confusion, confusion of baseball terms. But essentially, you know, Art Howe had to do as he was told or he would have to leave. And it, it's, it's very similar in football that, um, uh, you know, the, the football people prefer to go with the gut, go with their eyes. And they, they are, in my club, they're, they're learning now the language of data analysis and good decision making. And, you know, we're having an interesting time getting them to adopt it. Uh, but it's the same in investing. You know, people prefer to go with their gut. People think that they're geniuses. The industry tends to revere geniuses. They put their brands all over, uh, you know, distribution vehicles and sell billions of dollars of them until it all goes wrong. Right. They manufacture geniuses. <laughs> They're manufacturing geniuses. Well, but usually, usually there's just lucky. There's, there's so much luck. But you can, you can turn good luck into a good business in a very short period of time. What I was really thinking, what I should have said, was they manufacture stories about alleged geniuses. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Well, the, the, the problem with stories, again, football, what's true about football is true of many sports. Football is a low-scoring game. So the outcome of any particular um, uh, match is very much a function of luck. Uh, you, you, imagine that you have a slightly weighted coin. Uh, slightly weighted in favor of heads, but you, you only get to toss it three three times. The probability of getting a majority of heads is, you know, whatever it is, 50-50. But if you tossed it, um, you know, 100 times and it was slightly weighted in favor of heads, then it's almost certain that you'd get a majority of heads. But, um, you know, football on average has three scoring, three scores a game. The average score in football is 2-1. So, you know, the difference between a win and a loss is very, very much down to luck. But that's part of the charm. So part of the charm of football is that you then get all this narrative around the drama. And, you know, I often get Americans say, I don't like football, I don't like soccer because there's not enough scoring. But that's the point. So football is ripe for, you know, the narrative fallacy. It's ripe for taking outcomes that were really about luck turning them into drama and turning them into stories. And that, that's really part of the charm. Uh, you know, whereas in baseball, it's much more about you know, playing the odds, uh, but the outcome of an individual game is it, it, very interesting in baseball. If, if you go and watch your favorite baseball team um, and you know, they lose, you don't, there's not much emotion attached with that. You know, if, even if you're the best team in baseball, you're probably gonna lose 60 games that season. But uh, in football, the drama, the passion is much, much intensified by the fact that there's so much luck involved, even if people don't recognize that. As you describe this, I, I realize I don't really watch a lot of soccer. And is the screen as the TV screen as filled with numbers in a soccer match as it is in, say, an American baseball game or, or a football, American football game? Because it's numbers, numbers, numbers everywhere all over the screen constantly. Yeah, no, it's not. Um, the basic statistics of football are just starting to catch on. So, you know, number of chances created, number of shots on goal, number of uh, passes completed versus made. Um, the whole use of data analytics has been uh, heavily resisted in soccer and is really only just catching on now. But the, the, and the, I have to say there are a lot of teams that, you know, they hire a data analyst who then gets ignored. Um, you know, I've heard several stories of, from data analysts who say, you know, we, we have this process for identifying underpriced players, um, but really what happens is that a scout or a uh, agent will call up the manager, he'll look at a video for 20 minutes, make his mind up and offer him a contract. So th there's a lot of lip service paid, being paid uh, good process. Again, this is 
I think it's the same in many investment firms that there's lip service paid to process um, and, and structure, but in practice, people you know make their minds up, uh, go ex exercise judgment or go with their it, it it really is. They really are activities with a lot of parallels. I, I think that's true. They, you know, that they describe a process that is uh, data driven is a big word, right? You know, but, oh, yeah. data driven process. You know, okay, yeah. fine, fine, and and it and it's good as far as it goes. Certainly, Renaissance, Renaissance Technologies has taken it quite far. It certainly worked for them. Yeah, no one would believe, right? But there's also this other thing, Simon, that I've experienced as I approach my 60th birthday in a couple of months here. And that is at at one point in the past probably decade or so, it suddenly dawned on me that all this data I'm looking at, if it's a fact, it's in the past. And if it's not in the past, it's a guess. Now yes. you can arrive at that guess at any manner of process you wish to describe, but it is if it's about the future, it reduces to a guess in my opinion. A forecast. A forecast. Yeah, for, forecast. Yeah, let's, you know. let's be kind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is very kind. You know, and and around here, forecasting is getting to be like a four letter word almost. But mm -hmm. but okay, you know, I just I sort of wonder they 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 got somewhere in baseball with the analytics, but even those effects, you know, they've it's become much more difficult uh, because those initial effects it was so novel they they really made a big difference, and now everybody does it to death. So it's it's very efficient, but the game hasn't changed too much. And I'm wondering, you know, is there a sense of like, gosh, don't ruin soccer with all these numbers, you know? Is <laughs> very much so. I, it's not quite. I, let, let me just back up a bit to what you said. I mean, I have heard from some sources that a lot of baseball fans are now starting to resist it. That you know, it's changed the game. This use of data uh, has changed changed the game. And it's become too efficient. You know, people don't like don't like the shift. They don't like the fact that you know, what is it? Vertical lift is now studied. That the rotation on the ball is now studied. But this is partly the romance of baseball, and as in the romance of football, is that you want some judgment to remain. You don't want it all being driven by algorithms, because after all, it's a sport, and it's supposed to be entertaining, not just effective not just efficient and there is a sense in some quarters that that is beginning to that that will be the end result of all this data analytics used in football but we are so far away from it and it will never be never be as effective in baseball so baseball is a series of you know one-off matches it's a pitcher it's a batter then it's another pitcher and it's a batter and sometimes a fielder or a catcher is involved but that's basically it when and it's so it's a series of one-to-ones um, it's a batter to a, it's a pitcher to a batter, it's a batter to a fielder and, and so on. There's very little complexity in it. Um, whereas once you start getting five people on court, as in basketball, or 11 people on the pitch, as in NFL or soccer, uh, that complexity makes it much more difficult to, um, to analyze and get algorithmic in your decision making. But you can improve your decision making and i think that that's the key thing that you know the market is inefficient but you can improve it so you know what it depends depends what you want do you want a computer making decisions all, all the time or do you want to win more games you know what, what are your priorities in my case my priority is to win more games and i with limited resources that's that's the key thing uh, that, that's again, you know, it comes back to something I mentioned earlier. It's why it's like portfolio construction. When you're constructing a portfolio, um, you, you, you could, but you rarely kind of rank order the companies in your universe by, you know, the price to value relationship and take the 40 or 50 cheapest because you'd be missing out on the opportunity for diversification. And it's the same in, same in soccer. If you ranked all the available players, by you know price to what you thought they would be worth you you'd end up actually with a team of nothing but goalkeepers goalkeepers tend to be cheaper than outfielders and of course that that, that would not be that wouldn't be very effective in terms of producing results so um so you, you know i'm sorry i'm drifting away from the original question um but uh you you, you could you could definitely have too much 
data, but we're a long way from that in soccer. But we do seem to be well on the way towards uh, spectator resistance to the amount of uh, decision making that's data driven in baseball. And and apropos of nothing here, just just off the top of my head, to me, baseball and 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 soccer are in a similar category, just kind of in a poetic way. To me, they're like these more pastoral kind of experiences and they're they're less actually i i know soccer can get a little rough but they're less violent than football which to me is a highly technological warlike undertaking it's just battle and they look like they look like soldiers on the field and it's and you know the injuries to the brain and all this stuff it's just gotten crazy like i said apropos of nothing yeah, well, I think you're right. I think you haven't seen enough soccer. Um, okay, it sounds like it. There we go. Okay. <laughs> soccer, <laughs> soccer is a game. It, it's pastoral and it's played on grass. So it's played on a field, but that, that's about it. Um, you know, even, even in League One, you know, we had 13,000 fans yelling their heads off for 90 minutes on Saturday, 2,000 of which were yelling their heads off for the opposition. So, you know, if you take that to the Premier League or to the Italian, you know, Spanish first divisions, you know, these stadia are cauldrons of passion. And, 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 and soccer is a much more physical game than people normally think. Um, but the kind of lyricism that is associated with baseball has actually started to appear in soccer. So soccer traditionally uh, is very much a blue collar working class game. And the kind of lyric writers about sports tended to be writing about cricket, actually. So cricket is much more of a kind of pastoral, bucolic, baseball-like game that, you know, nobody outside your own country or few people outside your own country, or in Britain's case, a former empire, really understand. But they kind of know that it evokes the past. They, they write, there's a lot of nostalgia associated with it. Um, but what, what's happened as, as soccer in Europe in particular has um, moved beyond the kind of blue collar uh, um, strata, strata. It's, um, it's attracted a lot of great writers. So there's now absolutely first class writing about football. And of course, great writers who like to write about the lyricism of baseball, they tend to wallow in nostalgia a little. And we, we, we see the same in football, but, but football, though not pastoral, it does, does attract very good writing in the same way that baseball historically has attracted the best writers in the United States. All right. Well, I, uh, the, the topic of, of football, I mean, you know, when do we ever uh, have a guy like you in the program? So I couldn't resist it, but, no, but no. we should turn more in a more focused way to the topic of investing. And maybe you could just tell us about the firm a little bit, about Harding Lovner. Uh, sure. Well, we, we're, we're based in central New Jersey. Uh, we were founded in 1989 by Dan Harding, who left about 20 years ago, and David Lubner, who's still our chief executive. Uh, we are a rather old fashioned uh, stock picking, company research driven, uh, long only global equity investor. So we have you know, a limited number of different strategies that are avail available through different dis distribution channels, but they share a common philosophy that you know, we invest in high quality, long duration growth, growth companies. Um, we, 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 kind of, we like to say that we have three pillars to our investment philosophy, which is growth, uh, quality, and price or value, as Stanford listeners would like, like, to, like to say. So if, if we want to put it in the jargon of the industry, we, we're, we're probably, uh, actually these days we are now known as high quality growth companies, but over, a, over our 32 year life, we've been known as uh, value, growth, GARP, now today we're quality growth. And the, what's been interesting is the fashions and naming styles have changed. What we've done has been very constant over that 32 years. So it's, we, we, we do company research, we do it on a global basis, and uh, we pick stocks and we are long-term investors. So our average portfolio turnover tends to be you know, somewhere between 15 and 25 percent a year you know we've, we've still got some stocks that we've owned yeah we've still got some stocks that we've owned for 20 30 years what what i was thinking um the entire time you were describing even the developments in the in the naming of this style that has um remained 
you know, essentially the same as you describe it as even as the names have changed is that everybody today seems to want to own this. Everybody seems to want to own quality growth. And it's interesting to me that you had that third value component in there. So what does that look like here in in, uh, you know, approaching the, well, we're in the latter half, certainly of 2021. H how does that component look? It looks dangerous. Um, you know, it, it, well, the, the, the background here is that, um, you know, when we started, we didn't know that there was a quality factor that generated a return premium. Um, so talk about getting lucky, as we were referring to the combination of luck and skill, one of the things that got us very, got us, that made us very lucky was that our personalities said, look, we just want to invest in high quality companies. We don't want to trade much. We believe quite strongly that trading has cost and unknown benefits, certain costs and unknown benefits. Uh, many of our original um, clients, actually we started off with nothing, so I can't say original clients, but many of our first clients were taxable. And we strongly believe that, you know, even a minimal level of turnover in a portfolio was tax inefficient. But really, it was about our personalities. We, we didn't want to be frantically um, trading. Uh, we wanted to be studying companies and we wanted to be long-term investors. And we didn't want to have to worry about the companies in which we were investing. So for us, in those days, that was how we defined quality. Today, we're much more objective. You know, we talk about volatility of ROE. We talk about margins. We talk about volatility of margins and so on and so on and so on. But um, in those days, Again, you, 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 it's a kind of function of how we've evolved and how the industry has, has evolved. We used our judgment. We knew a high quality company when we saw one. Today, we can define it with data and you know, our objective, much more objective numbers. But there, there's still a judgment call at the end of it. Um, but we stumbled across this return premium, which has been pretty steady over the last 30 years. And we, uh, we've been worrying, I think this would be fair to say for four or five years, that quality was discounted. Everybody wanted quality, just as if you remember about 10 or 12 years ago, mean variance optimization and um, uh, you know, low vol portfolios were all the rage. I think they got priced out of uh, any uh, potential return premium. And I think there's a danger with quality there. I have to say that the kind of growth that we talk about, you know, and we've owned some of the fangs over the years, but the kind of growth that we talk about tends to be much more modest. Um, we're not looking for the kind of moonshots. We're much more looking for the very long-term compounders um, where the overpricing is, is much less evident, though, though, though it's still there. So what we've been doing in our portfolios over the last four or five years, um, really has been dialing down a little bit on the quality, dialing down a little bit on the growth, but dialing up on the value, just, just, just at the margin. But, you know, there, there are some years, I think this is one year where our global equity portfolio is outperforming, but not, not by as much as we've done historically. So, yeah, we're nervous. You're nervous, okay. Do you do anything about that or you're just long only? And do you, for example, in a long only, a, a classic move would be simply to to build a cash balance, um, if only as a residual from from sales, but you don't. No, we don't. We're, um, you know, I pe people often ask me about, about you know, my biggest mistake in investing. And I, I've i always thought that the big, you know, I started in this industry in 19, in the late 70s, whenever that was. Um, you know, after I graduated, I went to work for a bank and then after about 18 months, I went to work for an investment management company. And it was, um, it was actually before Margaret Thatcher was elected that, that long ago. And um, after I kind of learned just the basics of equity investing, and people forget that 45 years ago outside the United States, we weren't really equity investors. There's no culture of long-term equity. Uh, investment in equities outside the United States when I began. So, you know, although I was, you know, re reasonably well smart and certainly very reasonably smart and certainly very well educated, I didn't really know what a stock or a bond was. So I, fi I found out and pretty early on, I kind of started thinking, well, you know, this is a great way over the long term to save money and to invest. 
but stocks are too expensive now. And <laughs> it's like agricultural land, as my, uh, one of my friends was telling me the other day, agricultural land is always too expensive, but it's always too expensive. And that's kind of been my experience that, you know, again, it comes back to what I know about decision making and the biases we have. We tend to have different discount rates for things now and things in the future. We're much more risk tolerant in the future. Or as um, one of the professors of behavioral finance once said, you know, we all, want, we, all, we all want fruits and vegetables next week, but we want fats and sugars tonight. And it, I've always been the same with equity investing that, you know, I really like stocks for the long term, but they're a bit too, bit too rich for me at the moment. So we very, we very much adopted a policy that if we, if we get a new client, we put their money in, uh, you know, we, we ex execute ruthlessly uh, and quickly. If, um, uh, and you know, funny enough, I've done this in my personal life about three or four years ago. I decided that I was so bad at managing my own money that I was going to hand it to somebody else but other, because otherwise I was never going to get invested you know, after 40 years of the bull market. So um, you, you, you have to take measures to control your, your, what would otherwise be very bad investing behavior. Right. So Simon, when we say, and I say the same thing right now, when we say we're nervous or it's dangerous, yeah. we, we, we don't really, that, that's a form of market timing, isn't it? We think we know something about yeah, that. But we but, know nothing. We know nothing. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, we, we've, um, I think one of our great successes has been A, that we've been lucky. We stumbled across the return premium that, you know, that was clearly there 30 years ago that we didn't, that we, neither we nor anybody talked about the quality premium 30 years ago. People didn't talk um, about factors. I mean, it was, people yeah. didn't talk about factors. It was just you bought, bought a bunch of stocks, you know, <laughs> um, or bought a bunch stocks in a bunch of companies. I think probably the most accurate from our point of view. Um, I, I think so much of investing is coming back to soccer. So much of investing when, when people are giving their views, they're describing their psychological uh, state, and your psychological state has nothing to do with what the market's going to do. I, I mean, I hate we, I hate it when people say, you know, do you have conviction in this stock? Or one of our analysts says, I have high conviction in this stock. So psychological what? State. It's a psychological <laughs> yeah. state. So what? You know, whether you have high conviction or low conviction, the return's going to be the same. And, you know, you tend to make your best, best investment decisions when, you know, you have the least conviction, the most dangerous, at the most dangerous time. It's, uh, you know, are you comfortable with your, are you comfortable with your portfolio? Well, you know, I hope not. <laughs> you shouldn't be comfortable. You should be no. you know, lying, lying awake at night worrying about it. I, you know, but but you have to train yourself not to let those emotions influence your decision making. Right. So there's another side to this. It, on the one hand, it, it is absolutely true when we say we're nervous and it's expensive and dangerous. We really kind of don't know what we're talking about, at least in terms of timing, right? Um, but the flip side of that, Simon, is that undeniably undeniably cycles happen things are cheap at the bottom of the cycle and they're expensive at the top you know even just relatively it doesn't even have to be absolutely just relatively do, it sounds like we're almost headed in a direction where we're going to where you're about to tell me so what you can't do anything about it no that's correct that's correct um you you can do something about it but if you do it's likely to be very very expensive that certainly would have been you know, it would have been very expensive if you'd have done anything about it, unless you got lucky um, over the length of my career. You know, if you decided to take, you know, if, as soon as you got started getting nervous, you took 30% of the portfolio out. And even if you timed it at the bottom correctly, you know, another, another thing, you, you, if you start holding cash, you have to get two decisions right. And the combined probability of being right twice is very low. People underestimate pro, you know, how combined probability works. You know, if you say to somebody, you know, that you've got a 50% chance of this and a 50% chance of that, they, they'll kind of estimate that they've got a 35 to 40% probability of getting them both. And of course they don't. So if you've got to get two things right, the chances that you're going to get them both right are very, very low. So we've always taken the policy that, you know, we'll, we'll just stick in cash. And it, it's worked for the last 30 years for us. But who knows if it will in the future? I mean, as you say, it's very, very, very hard to forecast the future. I mean, I think all we can do, as I think you're, you're suggesting, is be nervous. You can, 
set your own expectations. In our case, we can work with our clients on their expectations. And we, we can tweak at the edges, but you know we really can't go out. And I think it would be irresponsible if we went out and started making major changes to the portfolio because we were nervous. And all this makes sense, right? Equity is this long-term, you know, more or less permanent type of capital. And, uh, it, you know, if you are buying quality, you're getting substantial, you know, nice, high, rich, double-digit ROEs. And you're getting these excellent returns compounding for all the cash that's put back in the business. It's a great long-term thing. And yet, I promise you, like 90% or some huge percent, I don't know what it is, of the people within the sound of our voice, they are trading in and out all the time. Even though, it, even though the nature of this investment is crystal clear, it is yes. long-term, ideally permanent capital, right? Yeah. Is this? I guess I'm just headed for another comment about human nature, aren't I? Like, how how do we how, how do we get past this? How does how do we teach? Do we ever do this? Do we ever teach great swaths of humanity that trading is going to ruin you? It's going to be high cost, and it could potentially possibly ruin you. Well, I I I commend you for even raising the issue. It's very unusual. I mean, when I look back over my career. Um, and the industry that I've been very lucky to have stumbled into. Um, I think we've done our clients a disservice because and by we, I mean financial services, services industry and associated what are loosely called media. But, you know, that includes podcasts. It includes, you know, CNBC. It includes the newspapers. We've done a disservice to our clients in failing to educate them about how to control their behavior their self-damaging behavior. To the contrary, um, large parts of the industry have encouraged people to transact. And one of the troubles with the industry, I think, has been that so much of the revenues that accrue to financial services are transaction-based. And people respond to incentives. So if I will encourage you all day long to transact if my incentives are to transact. You know, people often criticize the investment management business, and I can see why, for charging based on assets, but we have no incentive to transact. So, you know, I think that puts the investment management industry in a pretty good place. But I don't think we've educated our clients to do the same thing. And I, I should say that Harding Lovner's client base is both global, you know, we manage money for institutions throughout the world. Um, and it's a mixture of institutional high net worth ind individuals where we manage about 90 billion dollars which is distributed through all kinds of channels so i'm you know we're not a giant but we're reasonable size and we are in all channels so this transaction based activity applies in all channels this isn't a retail versus inst institutional thing as it's often characterized you know i often we, we often observe that our uh, although we've got a very good brand, we've got very good long-term track record, we have very good communications with our clients, um, people know and understand what it is that we're doing, they understand that there'll be periods in which we underperform, So, there's, and even the most sophisticated clients who are sophisticated enough to know they should never fire us because of short-term performance, we often get fired for completely, apparently completely different reasons, after periods of short term underperformance. So, you know, even a firm like us loses clients when short term results are poor. So it, it makes it very, very difficult. But I think it's, it's all of our responsibility to keep hammering home the importance of inactivity, the importance of, you know, a long term commitment, a, you know, policy document for individuals, anything you can do to tie your hands. We um, are, when it, one of um, our previous um, managers of the research department was first appointed, the first thing he did was to tie a print of an old oil painting of a disuse tying himself to the mast. And I think that this is very much what we need to learn as investors, that we need to put in place structures and processes that tie us to the mast. So when we get the siren calls of trade, 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 or here's a hot stock or you're missing out on X or 
you know, your friend over the road is benefiting from why we need to be heavily tied to the mast to stop us damaging our own investment returns. <clears throat> so uh, just for our listeners' sake, we're not going to talk about individual names. We, we usually do that um, on the podcast, but not always, to be fair, not always. And I really wanted to talk with Simon about football investing and a lot of other things. But Simon, we have been talking for a while. It is time for the final question. And I, I ask every guest, even sometimes when we go completely off topic and talk about things like health and fitness just once in a blue moon, the final question is the identical one for every guest. And it is simply, if you could leave our listener with a single thought today in mind, you may have already touched on it, what would it be? I'm going to quote Annie Duke, who oh, I much admire. A previous um, guest? The, oh, yes. I, yes. So I heard Annie talk about this the other day, and she says her biggest piece of advice is to be humble. And I've been thinking about it ever since. And we, we've always said that you need a dose of humility. But being humble really gets you all the way to thinking about uh, forecasting, about the limits to successful forecasting. It gets you to thinking about uh, possible events in terms of probabilities. And I've always said that I think we're very, very bad at um, thinking in probabilistic terms. You know, we tend to uh, think think in terms of binary outcomes. Either X is going to happen or Y is going to happen. And I don't believe Y is going to happen, therefore it's going to be X. Whereas, you know, in real life, it's probably 65% likely that one's going to happen and 35% the other. So I think being humble about our ability to forecast uh, is absolutely critical. And it implies that we need to go out and think about probability. We need to go out and think about our own behavior. Um, and we need to think about um, how we can control that behavior in order to control our or, or to enhance our investment returns. So associated with that is what I think is the probably the lowest hanging fruit in the investment world isn't a particular asset class or a particular security or something that's trading at great value or a short opportunity in some overpriced tech, tech, tech st stock. It's controlling your own behavior. Um, you know, you need to be humble about your ability to trade and you need to be more optimistic about about the ability of the companies in which you invest to generate long term returns. There's um, it's, it's very, very clear in the mutual fund world in particular that the difference between time weighted returns, which practitioners generate and the dollar weighted returns, which our clients generate out of those time weighted returns is different. and it, it me it's it's a it's it's a it's a gap it's a negative gap that the dollar weighted returns are less than the time weighted returns so that means that people are you know buying buying high and selling low and con behavior control is probably the best way to uh improve your investment returns rather than you know rather overconfidently chasing the latest bauble to flash across the uh tv screen Humility. Excellent. Excellent final thought. Thank you for that. We, it, it, you know, we could, we could probably do that one every week. <laughs> All right, Simon, it's been a real pleasure, I have to say. No, it's a pleasure. If ever you want to talk about football or soccer or the intersection, I'm very happy to do so, Even, you know, just for fun. It doesn't have to be on a podcast. You bet, Simon. Have a good day. Yeah. See you again, Dan. Bye. Well, that was really really fun for me i hope you enjoyed it as well i just as as you as you heard i really wanted to take the opportunity to talk to somebody who has lots of experience as an investor and then he's got this other sort of interesting business you know the business of owning a a, a soccer team in england and and find out where the intersection was and and what he had to say as an investor about both of those things you know it it's a it's a strange thing owning a football team apparently as you know as a business he obviously didn't quite approach it the way you know we would approach something where we definitely want a great return okay but i thought he had some interesting comments and i thought it was just absolutely delightful to hear him talk about the long term nature and the humility necessary for long term investment success most people are never ever going to make it as traders. 
They're just not. We have all kinds of tools at Stansberry if you want to be a trader. And, you know, frankly, if I can brag on us a little bit, we have people like Doc Eifrig. His, his track record as an options trader is just, it's endless. It's just endless success off into the distance. It's amazing. So it can be done. And if you have the right strategy and the right person uh, behind you, maybe, you know, you can do it too. But without that, you, you just wind up being overwhelmed by the market. You really do. Great talk, great thoughts, profound philosophical stuff for investors to consider. Wow, Simon Shalley, that was really great. Okay, that's that. Let's take a look at the mailbag. Let's do it right now. I want to share a quick story about a man named Ken Langone. The son of Italian immigrants, Langone describes himself as a dumb kid from Long Island that barely got out of high school and almost flunked out of college. Langone's dad was a plumber. His mom worked in a school cafeteria. But Langone lived the American dream. He went from $82 a week to one of the richest people in the world. Langone's most famous move was an early investment in Home Depot, which enabled him to become a co-founder of what is now the biggest business of its kind in the world, with 2,000 plus stores and 400,000 employees in North America. Because of Langone's Home Depot connection, he has unique insights into the current status of the U.S. economy, the labor shortages, supply chain issues, soaring prices, and increasing inflation. And that's why it was telling to see Ken Langone go public on CNBC recently with an alarming prediction. He also says the government is already creating major distortions and that the people they are trying to help are the ones who are going to get hurt the most. And my colleague, a former Goldman Sachs banker, Dr. David Eifrig, agrees. He says most Americans are completely unprepared for what's about to take place in our country. What exactly is going on and what has these successful and wealthy Americans so concerned? Go online to get the facts about this urgent warning by visiting www.loomingeconomywarning.com. That website again is www.loomingeconomywarning.com. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Just send your questions, comments, and politely worded criticisms to feedback at investorhour.com. I read as many emails as time allows, and I respond to as many as possible. You can also call us on the listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. Uh, nobody called in on the feedback line this week, but we got plenty of emails. First one is from Ben S. And Ben S. says simply, Dan, can you explain how our government could inflate away their debt? It seems like this would not be possible because the only way new currency is issued is by selling bonds or debt. Would all the debt just end up on the Federal Reserve balance sheet or is there some other mechanism for clearing it? Thank you for the great shows, Ben S. Well, yes, most of our money is, is brought into existence by being lent into existence. It's debt, but it's not government debt. Most of the stuff that's lent into existence in our money supply is like, you know, lent from, from one bank account to another, to another, to another. It's that multiplier effect that you get in a fiat currency uh, fractional reserve banking system. So how, but how the government could potentially inflate away debt is simply by monetizing it, by printing money and buying, and buying debt issued by the government for that purpose. Right. What what happens right now is that the Federal Reserve, sure, they go to the computer, as Ben Bernanke once told 60 Minutes, and they they mark up the account, meaning they just kind of press a button and electronically create money. But that money really doesn't go anywhere. They're buying bonds from from the you know people who are like f have accounts with the Fed, the Fed member banks. And so they're just it's just a swap. They're swapping you know, a, a bond for a, for a dollar, for, for, for an asset that just doesn't, you know, yield anything and just sits there like a dollar would. But it's not a dollar really because it doesn't go to, you know, you, nobody's going to take it to the grocery store and spend it. In fact, it never really leaves the Federal Reserve. It just stays in that account. 
So, you know, people who say QE makes the stock market go up have a lot of explaining to do in the end because that's that's how that works. It's just like it's almost like this, you know, quirky behind the scenes thing that nobody ought to care about. The reason you ought to care about it, though, that we wind up kind of caring is that there's a lot of it going on, like trillions and trillions and trillions of this stuff on the Fed balance sheet. And we just kind of wonder if they won't go the way of, say, you know, Bank of Japan and actually go into the market and buy equities. They have gone into the market and bought other types of debt. But again, they're buying it from, you know, people who have accounts at the Fed. So it's just so far, you know, that isn't that that is that's not going to create runaway inflation. But they could create lots of inflation, couldn't they, if they started monetizing the debt. In other words, the government says, you know, we're going to we're going to spend six billion dollars this year, but we only bring in, you know, whatever it is, two billion or so in taxes. So we're going to issue four billion in securities and the Fed is going to buy them outright. That is monetizing the debt and it would it would be a problem. That would be just like, you know, that could really set inflation going. So yeah, they can do it. I mean, the the ability to bring money into existence at the drop of a hat is there. It is a fiat currency. But the specific mechanism by which it's brought into existence and how it's moved around, that's what that's what will or will not get inflation going. I'll just leave it right there because that really what I just said is a, it's vague but it's kind of accurate, I think. Next is Terry I. Terry I writes in and says, Dear Dan, just listen to your last guest. He's talking about Cam Harvey. Just listen to your last guest and is truly one of your best, although there has been many. I'm very interested in this new financial revolution, as I believe it will be. But my question or questions are, will the big banks and governments let this occur? And he's talking about decentralized finance and and also, you know, just currency, you know, you, the idea of using Bitcoin as a currency, let's just say crypto in general. Terry I continues, I can't believe that they will sit aside and let this happen. Gary Gensler of the SEC has already said he will crack down on exchanges. And they also have a current lawsuit against Ripple Labs, the XRP token, and have supposedly sent a will notice or threatened to bring a lawsuit. Oh, uh, yeah, they've threatened to bring a lawsuit against the Coinbase exchange which is only a centralized exchange and not even a decentralized exchange. I truly believe that this will set the U.S. behind in this new financial freedom and asset, depending on these outcomes. What are your thoughts? And I, like you, I have more questions than answers. Haha. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. I, yeah, I still have more questions than answers. But, you know, you reminded me of a scene in, in a book called The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. And the hero is this renegade architect. And... He's leaving school and the dean of the school, you know, he, he, he's this, um, he's a renegade architect and he, he does all these drawings in a, in a, uh, in a very modern style in the book, right? You get the impression that, that Ayn Rand has channeled Frank Lloyd Wright through this guy, through this guy's style. Anyway, so, so the dean of the, of the school where, where this guy is leaving, he says, you know, do you really think you're going to be able to build this way in your career? And, and he says, he says, of course. And then the dean says, but who's going to let you? And then he says, who's going to stop me, basically? That's not a verbatim quote, but that's really it. The dean asks him, who's going to let you build this way? And he says, who's going to stop me? The real question is, who's going to stop me? And I feel like there's a lot of that dynamic in crypto and decentralized finance. You can governments could try to regulate all they want. They can regulate it all they want, but they're not going to stop it any more that they've stopped the crappy goings on on Wall Street by regulating it. And in many ways, they've probably made it worse. Right. Wall Street's incentives are terrible. They've been raping investors forever. Right selling them toxic waste and and all kinds of things they're they're just you know regulation hasn't helped <laughs> it's there's still lots of crooks and it's not even just crooks it's business models that are just awful right the regulations do not serve investors they serve the large incumbents and keep them in business so 
you know, I have no reason to suspect that dynamic won't infect the decentralized finance world, that it will mostly act to keep the biggest incumbent technologies or, or firms, however this works, however it plays out, it's very early days. As our guest Cam Harvey said last week, you know, it, we're 1% into this. But I, I suspect that there will be a, um, an advantage for incumbents created by the regulation. And frankly, you know, regulators, they aren't trying to shut things down. They're trying to get control of them. And, and a lot of it, I believe a lot of it, I believe, I, I can't say I know for absolute certain, but I think a lot of it is motivated by the fact that, you know, most politicians are just human beings and they go to Washington, D.C. because they know that coming out of Washington, D.C., they're probably going to be able to make a lot of money from all the connections that they made. So, you know, their motivations in regulating things are colored by that. And, and, and that's not I'm not even talking about regulatory capture, I'm just talking about the whole idea of having a centralized government where everybody can target them for influence and and the people being targeted love it because it puts money in their pockets. So that'll remain the dynamic and the regulation will not stop any of this it may slow it down. It may put the U.S. behind, as you suggest, but it will not stop any of it. I, I don't believe markets are things that humans create the way they, you know, the way they build an automobile or not, the way, you know, the way you, you build a house or not, or a machine. A market is just, it's more like an organism. It's a thing with a life of its own and you can't stop it. You can't, you know, U.S. drug laws have not stopped anything. They've just created a whole underground economy. And if they try to stop crypto or stop decentralized finance, they'll do the same thing. They'll just shove it underground, but it won't stop it. You can't stop markets. I mean, we can't stop markets in human trafficking, for God's sake, with, you know, all the all the laws of against, you know, kidnapping and rape and murder and all the rest of it. And, you know pedophilia and everything else. All the laws we've brought to bear have not stopped it. It's a thriving industry. So we're going to stop this thing, which is, you know, relative, which is uh, benign and quite beneficial to humanity, in my opinion. Yeah. Anyway, you see where I'm headed, Terry. I, I don't think you need to worry about the government so much. But as an interested party, you you do keep an eye on it, right? You never know. Next comes some comments from Matt O. Good to hear from Matt O. I, I'm pretty sure I recognize your name, Matt, and I'm pretty sure you've written in before. Uh, wow, so many people have written in that I can't remember if I've seen Matt O's name before. That's great. Sorry, Matt, it might not be great for you. But Matt has a lot on his mind. He says, I have two comments regarding your opening remarks on El Salvador's adoption of Bitcoin. Um, and then he says, you know, that El Salvador did not bake Bitcoin its sole form of legal tender. I thought I made it clear that I understood that, right? My complaint is that it the Bitcoin is not the legal tender. The legal tender is the US dollar twice removed because it's the US dollar through the El Salvadorian dollar or whatever, peso, whatever it's called. I don't even know or care. And then then to, to Bitcoin. And I said, Bitcoin is more like a payment system for them. And then he says, in my opinion, facilitating open competition on equal footing between crypto and fiat is the best approach governments can take to crypto adoption. Remove the tax impediment associated with treating crypto as a security, grant both forms of currency legal tender status, and let the people choose whichever currency they prefer. It will be interesting to watch El Salvador's experiment play out. I totally agree with everything you just said there. Number two, he says, I would submit that there is, in fact, a transaction fee built into much of our everyday commerce conducted in U.S. dollars because debit and credit cards are the most common forms of payment in the United States, 60 to 80 percent of transactions based on some research, he says. But, yeah, we know it's a lot. We know that's what people are mostly using, right? Uh, retailers likely factor the costs associated with these payment networks into their product prices. Of course, I didn't mean to suggest otherwise. I just meant that there's another layer on top of that when you use Bitcoin, right? So far, using Bitcoin is just kind of almost like using a credit card. You're ultimately priced in dollars because you're just translating from whatever the dollar price is at that moment through the transaction into the other side and, and you're priced in, and 
you know, what the dollar price is. That's what the holder of Bitcoin will have is the dollar price when the transaction's done. You know, even though they, you know, the thing will be priced in 0. 0.00213 Bitcoin or whatever the number, it's still going to be whatever the dollar price of Bitcoin is. You see, that's why I'm talking about fees in Bitcoin versus fees by just pulling paper dollars out of your pocket, let's say, not using a card and and doing it that way. But I hear you, Matt. Good stuff, Matt. Thanks for writing in. Uh, next comes Mike W. He said, hi, Dan. Looks like you picked an interesting week to take a break from the news. <laughs> Were you able to do it? Yes, Mike. I, As I said in the opening, I'm still doing it. Regardless, thank you for consistently great shows and keep up the good, good work. Best, Mike W. I'm proud to say, Mike, that I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Why was it an interesting week? I stayed away from the news and just looked at... Uh, you know, reports from various investment firms and other things. And, uh, you know, thanks for the uh, for the kudos saying that we produce consistently great shows. We sure try to do that. Lastly, this week, once again, we hear from Lodovic H. Always very happy to hear from him. I think he wrote in three times this week. He usually writes in, you know, at least twice a week. And Lodovic says, I have a question for you. There seems to be a big move towards Puerto Rico. It is not part of the United States, so no federal tax. But why? There's the ongoing push to bring it into the USA. Sooner or later, people will vote destructive and towards poverty. I think he means they'll vote in a destructive manner and, and that'll create poverty. Why not select Vanuatu? <laughs> from a tourism perspective, because it's a beautiful place, and from an investment perspective. Uh, and then he includes these links that will tell you about getting a second passport in Vanuatu. Lodovic, you know, man, the choice between Puerto Rico and Vanuatu is just not on my radar screen. But I mean, Puerto Rico scares the crap out of me. I, I think there's still a pretty good crime problem down there. And and, you know, I, I just hear about people I know who who have gone there and visited and stuff and say, wow, you know, if you're inside of a gated community, you're OK. But but um, it's scrappy doings elsewhere. Maybe they're maybe they're exaggerating. But I don't know anything about Puerto Rico. I just wanted to read your email because I think your point that if you think you're moving to Puerto Rico because they're going to bring it into the United States, I think that is a very optimistic view of the situation. And you know something, Ludovic, I have to say, that's probably still true. If you're living in Puerto Rico now, and all of a sudden it becomes a U.S. state, it wouldn't surprise me one bit if it were suddenly became a much safer place to live, just because you know, if it's part of the United States, it's easy for everybody in the United States to go there. All of a sudden, it's like going from, you know, it's like instead of like going from the United States to a foreign country, it's like going from the United States to. So I have to say, and I hate to say it, you can really, you really put a bug in my head about this. That's why I included your question. I know your questions are kind of different. You know, you're suggesting Vanuatu and all this stuff. But but the issue that you put into my head that I can't get out of it is, oh, I, you know, I'm critical of the United States government. But, oh, you know, if suddenly Puerto Rico were the 51st state of the United States, I think within, you know, a fairly short time, I don't know if that's months or years, probably some number of years, it would be a nicer place. It would. The roads would probably be better. And, you know, everybody there could get all the all the things that you could get in any U.S. state just by being a U.S. citizen. So, look, I, I claim that I'm a libertarian, but I can't prove it because I don't spend half my life in jail. But if, if you know, put to it and, and forced to, to judge one way or the other, you know, I have to say what I just said about Puerto Rico and about being a United States uh, state. Thank you for making me think about that, Lodovic. Great question. Well, that's another mailbag, and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We do provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com, click on the episode you want, scroll all the way down, and click on the word transcript, and enjoy. 
If you like this episode, send somebody a link to the podcast and help us continue to grow. Anybody you know who might also enjoy the show, just tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at investorhour.com. Do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at Investor Hour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. If you have a guest you want me to interview, drop me a note, feedback at InvestorHour.com or call the listener feedback line 800-381-2357. Tell me what's on your mind to hear your voice on the show. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email. Feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.